Hello and welcome to another of the Talk Wildlife interviews and today I have back with me and I'm delighted that she is back with me Ellie Colver from the British Dragonfly Society. Hi Ellie. Hi, how are you doing? Great, thanks. How are you? <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> thanks for having us back. Oh, no problem, no problem. You've got lots to talk about which is really good. <laughs> so, and Ellie is the Conservation Officer for England and Wales and we're going to talk today about basically just a few of the species so dragonfly conservation in general but just picking on a, a few of the species that are either not doing so good or sort of doing good and then right at the end we'll talk about a new arrival or a potential new arrival so that'll be really good so <laughs> da, 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 the big bill <laughs> Um, and if your cat doesn't put in an appearance, I'll be most disappointed. <laughs> so, so to start off with, if we just give a, a, a sort of brief overview of generally how dragonflies are doing in the country. Sure. Um, so in Britain, we have 58 species which have been recorded here um, and roughly 46 of those are resident species, uh, meaning they breed here. And then the rest of those species are um, either kind of regular migrants or kind of rare vagrant species, which uh, occasionally rock up. Um, so that's kind of um, how many species we have. Um, but then um, in terms of, kind of how species are doing, um, generally we're seeing that kind of the number of species we have in the UK is actually increasing. Um, and this is also to do with um, climate change. Um, so dragonflies as a group are kind of uh, associated with the tropics. They love warm weather. Um, so as our climate's been warming, are we seeing um, species that were kind of um, limited to kind of continental Europe are kind of um, out or kind of south of Europe are slowly kind of increasing their range northwards. Um, so we're seeing kind of these kind of new um, species kind of turning up in the UK and breeding for the first time. And we'll touch on a few of those um, later. Um, but on the other side of things, um, a, a few species um, are um, of our few of our resident species and we, we actually have concerns of and this is either to do with kind of climate change, which is kind of impacting um, their habitats um, and kind of altering the distribution of their habitats or um, as a result of kind of human activities um, so kind of habitat destruction or kind of um, uh, kind of human activities that kind of change the, the, the qualities of their habitat kind of through kind of pollution um, or kind of drainage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, what I'll do is I'll um, so to put that into context for sort of some of the species, and and by talking about some of the species, you, you know, it, it'll you know it'll give people a, a bit of a broader overview. Mm. Uh, clearly, we can't talk about all the species because <laughs> nobody would want to talk to me for that long. Um, but we'll we'll certainly talk about some of the species. So what I'll do is I'll just um, I'll just share screen, and then we'll go into sort of a few more of them. So we've got the southern damselfly. So we've started off with a few that are actually sort of, you know, declining and in trouble from for various sort of different uh, you know, reasons. So let's start off with this one, southern damselfly. So this is declining. Yeah, so this is one of the only two um, legally protected species of um, Odonata um, in the UK. And this is the only species of damselfly that's protected. Um, and it's a species which um, is only found on um, a few isolated sites um, in southern, predominantly in southern England and southern Wales. Um, it's um, real key areas being New Forest, Hampshire, um, Roselli Mountains and Pembrokeshire um, and it's <laughs> as you see from the picture it's one that's very similar to um, our common blue and azure damselflies which are both blue and black little species of damselflies uh, which makes it quite hard to um, kind of tell apart um, the southern damselfly um, to identify it I have to look for a tiny little marking um, on the back um, to identify it, particularly on the males, there's like a little mercury marking um, on its abdomen. Um, but this species is, um, as we're talking about kind of species with um, very specific habitat requirements, this is one of those species. Um, this, this damselfly um, requires um, slow flowing um, shallow streams, but not only that, they have to be, have a inorganic stream bed, um, they have to be unpolluted, um, unshaded, 
and they have to have a permanent flow that doesn't freeze in the winter in order for the larva to survive. So obviously that's a, a very specific habitat um, yeah. which ne will need kind of constant management to kind of maintain it as kind of um, open and unshaded. Um, on top of that, um, the species is an incredibly um, poor flyer. It can only disperse a few hundred meters. Um, so unless um, so kind of back in the day when kind of um, our habitats were, we had a lot more kind of freshwater habitats and it would have been able to kind of migrate to kind of new areas of kind of um, kind of suitable habitat. But as its habitat been kind of just um, undergone um, kind of alteration and become more and more fragmented, um, it's kind of been stuck in these kind of isolated little patches, uh, making it particularly uh, vulnerable to extinction. Yeah. And, and just how bad is that? I mean, you know, what's the decline looking like? Is it is it significant or is it steady? Um, I mean, thankfully, um, over kind of the, the past couple of decades, um, we've seen quite a lot of work um, done to uh, protect the surviving um, uh, species, but they have they they are still kind of under threat. Um, we've um, there was a lot of concern earlier on um, in the year with a development um, near um, within the Eastleigh SAC um, that we were keeping an eye out um, on where they were looking to um, do a, a large development near one of kind of the strongholds um, in the uh, Itchen Valley. Um, so there was a lot of concern about that. Thankfully, that development's been kind of put on the back burner. Um, but it's just kind of a, an example of where there are kind of continuous threats to the to the populations um, and it's kind of something that really needs to be kind of kept an eye on. Um, we have um, we do keep in contact with um, a number of kind of uh, other charities um, and land managing organisations to ensure that their kind of habitats um, are um, managed suitably. And we have um, the Dorset Damsel, uh, Dorset Southern Damselfly um, group, um, which meets up um, kind of regularly um, to kind of discuss kind of how we can kind of continue to, to manage their habitat. Yeah, yeah. Right. OK, so that that really is sort of down to um, what is it? Is it mainly pollution? What you know, when, when we say that, that it's in decline, what, what's the main risk to those? Um, it is um, just kind of habitat destruction. It's a, it's a mixture of things, really. It's, it's destruction of habitat, um, fragmentation of habitats, um, degradation of habitats, so through pollution, um, kind of um, poor management, so kind of not kind of staying on top of um, kind of vegetation growth, um, so not maintaining kind of um, their streams as kind of open and unshaded. Um, and then climate change as well. So um, as we're getting kind of um, kind of less regular rainfall, we're seeing kind of more um, droughts um, throughout the summer months. Um, yeah. That's really kind of putting kind of um, their kind of water availability at risk. So kind of uh, threatening the kind of the shallow streams that they rely on. Right, right. And next, the azure hawker. Uh, quite limited range this as well, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah. So this is, um, again, a species with quite um, a specific habitat. We're going to the right the other side of the country now. And um, this is a, a species that's um, predominantly found in the highlands, um, in bog pools. Um, and this is a species that is limited, um, is uh, status is vulnerable. Um, so this in the past has been, this is a species that's been um, uh, threatened through kind of um, upland management schemes, so drainage um, or kind of forestation um, to create kind of like uh, timber woodland and timber forests. And um, so those have been kind of some of the um, the past threats to the species and some that are being kind of tackled now, now that we kind of know a bit more about the species um, and their distribution um, and land managers are becoming a, a bit more aware of um, the, the kind of um, the species needs and our um, Scotland officers are doing quite a lot of work with this species. But this is again another species which is uh, threatened um, by climate change. Um, erratic rainfall means that um, a lot of their bog pools um, are now under threat and we don't really kind of know what the, the, the kind of future distribution of the species is going to be. So with something like the Azure Hawker, because you've mentioned bog pools and, you know, as I said, when we first introduced it, very limited range up in the Highlands. Yeah. Um, would there be possibilities of sort of you know, basically introducing them into other areas of the UK to try and help sustain their population? 
I mean, the problem with this species is it's currently where it is in the UK is kind of really it's kind of southernmost range. So you can't there's not really anywhere to go <laughs> for this species. It's right. kind of adapted to kind of the, the higher altitudes and the cooler climates. Um, so it's kind of really within the, the kind of the extent of, the, of its range. Um, so kind of conservation efforts are kind of really now just to kind of um, maintain its existing kind of distributions and make sure that we have um, a really good idea of its distribution and where its existing populations are and then working with land managers to do kind of um, activities which will kind of protect those habitats so kind of filling it and um, filling in dra um, drains and bog pools um, kind of filling in drainage ditches um, kind of kind of maintain kind of water um, accumulation um, and kind of stop um, runoff uh, from those bog pools and um, really just to help when we do have kind of these periods of kind of low rainfall that we've seen um, over the past few years. Yeah, yeah, right. Okay, so yeah, it's quite weird that it's sort of the highlands of Scotland, it's, it's more southerly range. That <laughs> sounds mad, doesn't it? When you think yeah. about something like a, a, a dragonfly, you think, well, mm. you know, heat and tropics and the Mediterranean and, and you don't think well yeah north of Scotland it's more suddenly part it's, it's quite weird. Yeah and it's kind of uh, one of those issues it's like um, one of those kind of threats that we don't really think about is kind of how the species is going to interact um, and whether these kind of as the, the climate um, warms up at the moment the only other kind of species that you would you, you would only associate it with a kind of a few other species which are capable of living in cooler climates such as kind of the common hawker which is another moorland species um, but as kind of the climate warms and it's kind of it's existing bog pools um, become suitable for other species and we see other more suddenly species kind of moving into these habitats um, it's going to be interesting to see how the azure hawker kind of interacts with those new species and whether we see any kind of interspecies competition going on yeah yeah that will be interesting to keep an eye on i haven't seen one yet so one day i'll get up there and get midge bit and then go and see them it's a good excuse <laughs> <laughs> and next one which you know the, the, this is sort of a little bit of a surprise to me um variable damselfly because i didn't realize that its numbers were actually declining um so tell us a little bit more about you know why they're declining and what the key threats are to them yeah, so this is a species um, which status is near threatened. Um, sorry, the cat's grappling for attention right now. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, cat, by the way, is a cat. It's not a person called cat who's just. <laughs> um, well, oh, I can't remember what I'm saying now. Um, <laughs> yeah, variable damselfly. Um, yeah, this is a species which um, is associated with kind of um, well vegetated ponds and ditches and also kind of. Um, can be found in kind of patches on canals where you've got a lot of kind of vegetation growing up and the water um, flow is very slow. Um, so it sounds like it's got a kind of a, a wide range of habitats that it can utilise and it is um, quite, it does have quite a large distribution within um, England and Wales. Um, however, within its distribution, um, it's quite widely scattered and not particularly common. Um, and this is all to do with the fact that it's quite a, a sensitive species, particularly to pollution and enrichment, um, which is obviously a, a, a big issue within our kind of our waterways um, at the moment. Um, there's been a kind of quite a lot of reports coming out about the issues with kind of um, neonicotinoid poisoning within our kind of river systems. Um, so these are all kind of factors that kind of play into kind of its kind of scattered distribution. Um, and Another problem with the species is it's another little blue and black damselfly, um, which makes it not particularly easy to um, to identify. And it also um, often occurs alongside kind of common blue and azure damselflies um, in similar habitats. So as well as being um, kind of naturally kind of like already kind of scattered and uncommon, um, it's probable that um, a lot of um, populations um, kind of go unnoticed and therefore don't receive the kind of the right level of protection um, and therefore can kind of get lost um, through kind of lack of management. Yeah, yeah, right. OK, and and so I know that I spoke to you in the last interview. Not quite sure why that and jumped ahead like that, but we'll come back to that. Um, but I know I talked to you in the last uh, interview about some of your citizen science projects and your mm. recording is there anything on the cards for maybe doing a bit of a citizen science project on this to see what the numbers are 
Um, totally. Um, I, it's a species that um, definitely needs a bit more um, attention. Um, so it would be a, a good one to kind of um, ask people to keep an eye out for, um, particularly those who are a bit kind of um, those who are kind of know the kind of their common species. This is a, a good one to kind of familiarise yourself with. Um, if yeah. you, you know it kind of appears in your counties, it's a good one to kind of keep an eye out for, especially if you're um, in areas with kind of ponds and, and slow flowing um, canals. Um, where there's a kind of a, a good kind of community of aquatic plants. This is a, a good species to look out for. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, I'll look forward to talking to you about that one in the future. Um, we, we have another one now. This this is. Got, I'm going to let you explain in a second why this is put down as an uncertain future. Uh, but there's been quite a lot of social media activity around this species at the moment, given that they're being seen in sort of unusual places especially in Norfolk. I mean, the one that I took there, which is the larger of the two photographs, um, that was taken in a woodland four miles from the house. And it's a woodland that doesn't have, well, it certainly doesn't have any water soldier because it doesn't have any water. So, so it's a bit of a weird one, this, because all of a sudden this year I've noticed on social media, they've been spotted in areas that just basically don't sort of sit comfortably with what you'd expect their habitat to be. So can you talk to us about sort of, you know, why you think that is as well as why we've put this one down as an uncertain future? Yeah, so uh, Norfolk Hawker, um, this is a, a species, um, as you would guess from the name, it is primarily associated with Norfolk and Suffolk as well, actually, um, where it was kind of, its historic distribution was predominantly kind of uh, within ditch systems, within kind of fens and grazing marshes with kind of rich aquatic vegetation. And that kind of still um, is its kind of core distribution. Um, and in the past, um, its kind of main threats have been kind of um, intensification of agriculture, um, pollution, uh, drainage, um, all the all the kind of uh, the classic threats that we see for, to uh, dragonflies. Um, uh, it's it's an interesting one because it has seen in, in recent years it has seen um, a um, an increase in range kind of moving um, further um, west um, and kind of um, uh, inhabiting and colonizing kind of new breeding areas um, and one species one um, pattern that's been noted is that it's often um, associated with water soldier um, which has become quite a popular um, um, plant that people have put in their ponds and it's also um, unfortunately in some places become quite invasive and um, people have been having um, a bit of an issue with it um, but um, it is a species of plant that the Norfolk um, hawker absolutely loves and loves to lay its eggs on and it's a, a, a prime uh, uh, plant for, the, for um, their larvae to um, emerge from um, as well so it's often associated with this, this, water, um, this wetland plant um, and can often means be found in kind of easterly sites where um, and like ponds and lakes where this plant is kind of growing in abundance. Um, and the fact that we have seen this kind of this kind of increase in distribution kind of um, would give the impression this is quite a a, a, um, a, a strong um, flying species. It's a species that kind of does kind of move away from its kind of natal um, breeding site from its kind of natal larval home um, to look for kind of new habitats which could suggest why we've been seeing it in kind of new areas um, and kind of unusual habitats. Um, we have had kind of uh, an incredible kind of start to the dragonfly breeding season, um, some amazing weather, um, which has kind of just boosted kind of dragonfly um, activity and potentially kind of encourage dragonflies to kind of um, move away and um, be more active and maybe kind of migrate away from the kind of their um, um, previous um, breeding sites. Yeah, yeah, right. Interesting. So the the uncertain future that we're talking about here. Oh, yes. Sorry. <laughs> so um, <laughs> forgot about that. So um, yes. Yeah, so whilst um, the, oh, I forgot to mention also, this is um, the other species of um, dragonfly that's protected, um, legally protected. Um, and while we have seen kind of an increase in distribution, um, there is kind of a lot of uncertainty about um, the um, safety of its um, kind of core range and um, that being kind of lowland Norfolk and Suffolk um, because these um, areas of um, 
wetland are kind of most at risk from sea level change um, and the species has very limited um, ability to deal with kind of brackish conditions so as, as the kind of sea level rises a lot of its kind of um, ditch systems and fens and marshes are at risk to being kind of um, inundated with saline water um, which could really kind of be detrimental to the North Norfolk Colker. So it's a species that we really need to keep an eye on. Yeah, so if it's going to do itself any favours, it needs to be moving sort of inland and sort of in a, a westerly direction. Yes, so if we could continue to kind of push out, that would be uh, fantastic. <laughs> it would definitely help. <laughs> I'll, I'll have words next time I see them. Yeah. <laughs> right, certainly one I haven't seen, um, but scarce blue tailed damsel. Oh, I love these. They're really cute and um, they're one of my favourite. I love blue tails and uh, the common blue tailed uh, damselflies anyway. Uh, particularly this one because uh, scarce blue tailed um, as an immature um, the females um, in, once they've just um, emerged the immature uh, scarce blue tailed um, damselfly are bright orange. They're absolutely fantastic. Um, but this is, um, a, a, apart from that, this is quite an unusual species, um, quite similar in appearance to the blue-tailed damselfly. Um, but if you have a look at this segment, the, seg the blue segment is slightly lower down um, on its abdomen. Um, and this is a, a species that's associated with kind of early successional wetland habitats. So kind of newly created pools with limited um, vegetation. Um, and this is naturally um, a species which is um, Kind of colonizes is a, a kind of colonizes um, new kind of newly created wetland pools, um, and it's compared to we were talking earlier about the southern damselfly being a really poor uh, migratory species, having uh, being a really weak flyer. This is like the exact opposite. The species kind of requires the ability to kind of fly long distances in order to find these kind of newly created um, poorly vegetated pools, because over a while these pools will naturally um, go through a successional phase and kind of will, more vegetation will grow and they'll become um, unsuitable for the damselfly after a period of time. Um, and this was a species that um, almost went um, extinct at the turn of the 19th century um, and then kind of went through a boost uh, during the period where um, in upland areas um, farmers were encouraged to increase um, livestock densities in farming because this created all these kind of mulched areas with kind of pools with no vegetation which the damselflies loved um, but then when stock densities were told to like we start reducing stock densities to kind of conserve other kind of like wetland habitats in the uplands um, that was rubbish for the scarce blue tail. So this is a really hard species to conserve because it likes habitats that nothing else likes basically. Um, and you end up finding it in um, weird places like quarries um, in particular. It loves quarries because this is basically creating, when you create a quarry, you create loads of kind of little pools um, with like no vegetation. So that's often where you can, you can find it in place, particularly in places like Devon. Um, there's been some um, kind of quite um, impressive um, uh, little populations found in these kind of strange little tiny micro habitats. Um, so this is, um, while it's kind of, it's a, a species that's listed as near threatened, but in terms of conserving it, it's quite difficult to conserve because its habitats are naturally don't last that long. Um, so once it is found in a habitat, um, often we kind of talk to people about trying to manage a kind of a period like um, a, um, a mosaic of successional pools where you'll have um, one pool that kind of um, kind of um, you'll kind of like manage them in a kind of a, um, a routine um, of kind of clearing them out every couple of years so you, you always have kind of a population in, in a pool and um, you can kind of kind of clear one pool out and the other population is still okay and then one that one clear <laughs> I'm losing my place now <laughs> but basically kind of managing um, pools in a kind of a rotation so that you can in order to kind of maintain a population um, because it is kind of a, a difficult one to manage. Um, yeah, it's a it's a it's a bonny little dragonfly. Yeah, I can I can see why it's one of your favourites. I mean, <laughs> you know, that that orangey gold colour is absolutely stunning. It's a lovely little thing. So, yeah. So so what's the stronghold for them at the moment? You mentioned was it sort of south west? Uh so it's really scattered. It's got again. It's one of these species that has a quite a large range. So 
Wales and then South England and the Midlands um, really. Um, so it's got a very quite a wide range, but within this range it's not common and its populations are very scattered. And um, so it's kind of a popular like a, a damselfly that you have to keep a kind of a, a constant eye on because it's its distribution is yeah. co constantly changing. Um, so it's quite a hard one to kind of monitor and decide kind of and kind of determine kind of what trends that the, the population's doing and uh, kind of how well the, the species is doing because it is kind of constantly changing its um, distribution. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, you, you've got that issue again where it's another sort of blue damselfly. However, yeah. there's no mistaking, <laughs> there's no mistaking the female, that's for sure. Totally. Yeah, <laughs> it's just keeping an eye out for those, uh, for those brightly coloured little uh, newly um, emerged damselflies. They're really yeah. quite fantastic. But uh, yeah, I mean, we've had them being reported from all sorts of places like um, air, like uh, in areas that are used for kind of quad bikes and things like that, where they've created these kind of little, basically just like little puddles, um, open puddles. And they found damselflies kind of breeding in there. Um, so it's, it's quite an unusual species. Yeah, yeah. And now on to one that, um, so we, we've talked about a few that are sort of a little bit in trouble and that we're now starting to talk about ones that um, like the migrant hawker, which is expanding its range. So this was sort of, to start off with, it was a, it was a migrant over here, wasn't it? And that now it's sort of, I, I wouldn't say a common one, but it's certainly becoming established. Totally. So the, the migrant hawker has its name because originally it it wasn't just a migrant species that occasionally rocked up um, in the UK, but now it's, I mean, in Europe it's widespread, but now in the, the UK, um, um, it breeds across England and Wales and mm. is in fact kind of expanding into Scotland. So it's done kind of remarkably well. Um, and again, we were talking about um, how um, if a species has the ability to utilise um, a range of habitats, um, it's generally going to do better. And this is a species that can utilise um, kind of both standing and slow flowing um, habitats, so kind of ponds, rivers, canals. Um, so yeah, um, it's a, one that kind of our um, Scottish um, dragonfly watchers are kind of keeping an eye on. Everybody wants to kind of spot it in the, the new county. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I it, it's they're amazing um, hawkers, and it, I've seen them in sort of quite big congregations in parts of Norfolk, uh, where they almost you'd look at it and you think actually you know it almost looks like a colony because there's so many of them together. Um, Strumshaw Fen is brilliant for that. So yeah, really impressive hawker and really impressive when they they gather in quite big numbers. Yeah, you can see large swarms of them, um, and I've should say that we're getting into like prime hawker times now, kind of mid to late summer is kind of your best time to seeing migrant hawkers. I um, always look forward to um, bird fair in August because I usually get to see kind of large uh, swarms of kind of migrant hawkers there. Um, and this is a, a I should say a favourite snack of the hobbies as well, hobby because it does kind of appear in, in large swarms. So it's um, a favourite food for hobbies. Yeah, yeah. And then we've got the southern migrant hawker, which I just missed at a patch local to me uh, last year. When I say I missed it, I couldn't find it. Everybody else seemed to, apart from me. <laughs> so this year. This year. Typical, so, typical. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and again, you know, that not because the, these are sort of quite scattered uh, sightings around the country, but the, these are actually a breeding species down in... Is it the Thames estuary? Where is it? Yeah, so um, this is um, a species which currently um, is generally associated with breeding in the Thames estuary. I think it started, it was first noted breeding in Essex in 2011. So this is a, a really new um, breeding species for the UK. We really need to learn the lesson of not putting migrant in the name of species because they're just yeah. going to end up breeding here. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, this is a one to keep out, um, keep an eye out for if you're in the, the southeast. Um, it is kind of we are kind of seeing kind of um, it kind of rocking up kind of in different various counties and within the southeast. Um, so it is a species that's likely to kind of increase its breeding range. Um, so do keep an eye out for it if you're kind of yeah down in the sunny southeast. Yeah, uh, it certainly will be doing. 
bit and, far for me in Stafford, unfortunately. But <laughs> oh, you, you, you'll have to sort of pay a visit down to mind you. Having said that, as I say, I, I missed it. They were at um, oh, I forgot where it was. It's Norfolk Suffolk border. There's a reserve down there, and I I couldn't find it. For the more I looked, the sort of less likely I was to find it because you know it's like you, you just put all your effort in, and it's like where is this? Thing? But anyway, next time. Um, now this one, this this one's something that's it's. I don't think exploding is the right word, um, but this one seems to be doing really, really well and spreading out quite rapidly. Is this the Willowed Emerald? Yeah, the Willowed Emerald. Are, are you not yeah. sure? <laughs> Sorry, I can't see the screen. <laughs> you can't see the screen? Oh, yeah. I can see you, but uh, it's oh. all right. It's, it's like a good quiz for me. I could have to try and guess the species based on what you on your description. <laughs> it's weird that you can't see the screen. That, that has me worried. We might have to be redoing this, but let's see how we get on. <laughs> right. So Willow Emerald, just to give you a clue, Willow Emerald damselfly. Um, numbers seem to be doing really well, seems to be spreading out quite well. Yeah. So that. Thanks to um, Adrian Parr, who's running our Willowed Emeralds Watch um, uh, Citizen Science Project, which is all about keeping an eye out for the species. We've been able to track it quite well. Um, so this species kind of first exploded onto the scene in 2009 um, in Suffolk and Essex. And since that, that has just kind of exploded, kind of, yeah, properly kind of spread out across the, the southeast of, of England um, and now is found kind of as far east as Oxfordshire um, and uh, in 2009 was um, it really kind of spread up the east coast and was even found as far north as North Yorkshire um, and this is a, a really interesting species because it's um, a species which um, lays its eggs in woody um, vegetation um, above the water um, so one of the things we've been asking people to do is look out for little egg laying scars um, on the um, branches of willow and also other woody vegetation such as bramble um, to see if the species um, is trying to breed uh, within a wetland um, and it, it is it's doing fantastically well. Um, what would be interesting to see is um, one of the questions I have is um, how it's interacting with our um, resident species of um, emerald damselflies and whether there's any kind of competition between those species um, but yeah it's, um, it's a, an interesting one to keep an eye on. It'll be oh, interesting yeah. to see how it does this year. <laughs> Definitely. And, and just uh, for people that might not be familiar with um, its egg laying, do you want to just give a little bit more of an overview of so sort of how it how it lays its eggs and what a, a scar would actually look like? Sure. So um, with the Willow Emerald, um, the females have um, what's called a um, is, is it ovipositor? It's like a little spike um, at the end of its abdomen which it inserts um, into um, the branch um, of a um, of a, a willow tree or into brambles it's been found in things like nettles as well um, and inserts its egg um, and once that egg is um, ready to um, hatch um, the tiny little um, larval will um, hatch out the egg and then fall into the water below um, so um, Obviously, this is quite unusual because um, predominantly species in the UK kind of lay their eggs kind of um, in um, in water or kind of on plants kind of um, around the water's edge. It's kind of the, the only species so you can kind of see it laying um, its eggs into um, the branches of trees. Um, so if you do find its egg laying scars, um, which are basically just kind of little pinprick bumps, um, on the, the surface of a branch and if you look on our Willowed Emerald Watch um, website you'll be able to kind of see some examples of it. Um, you know that it's, it's a Willowed Emerald damselflies um, egg laying scars, it's not going to be anything else. Yeah I'll put a link to that um, yeah. and they, they are really interesting to watch actually doing that because it's it's basically like them injecting the egg yeah. into the actual branch, it, it, it's really cool to watch. So we have another emerald, the yellow spotted. Ooh, so this is uh, an exciting one. So this was the last species to be added to the list for Britain. This was a species that was first, which only has um, one sighting for in Britain, and that sighting was made in 2018 by Andrew Easton, um, who was visiting Carlton Marshes, um, which I think is run by Suffolk Wildlife Trust. 
um, better get that right. Um, and yeah, he just saw this um, unusual um, emerald damselfly, didn't know what it was, put it up on Twitter, um, and a natural history um, writer called uh, James Weldon had looked at it and went, wait a minute, that's a new species, that's a uh, yellow spotted emerald damsel. Uh, emerald dragonfly. Um, so that was a, a really exciting find. Um, this is a species um, which I think is basically found in kind of peaty wetlands and fens and bogs. Um, it's not like other species um, which you'd associate as kind of a migratory species like the red veined darter, um, which we get turning up every year. Um, we're pretty sure this was just a, a one off sighting, but it's just kind of um, goes to show that you never know um dragonflies can kind of just get blown in and um it's just um goes to show you, that you should kind of keep your eye out if you're on the coast because that's where most of our um our migratory species and vagrant species sightings come from yeah yeah so so what are we talking about here are we talking about that this excuse the background noise i would just have some fighter planes decided that they're going to do a dog fight over the top of my house <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> um, so what are we talking about? Are we talking about that there's been the odd sighting, you know, or, you know, there's been quite a few sightings, you know, how, what we what we're looking at? Um, I mean, this was totally a one off sighting, um, but in terms of kind of migratory species to the UK, um, I mean, we get um, annual kind of influxes of migra migratory species. Um, the red veined data was one I kind of I, I just mentioned, and that's a species yeah. which can literally rock up anywhere in the UK. Um, again, most particularly in the southeast that's where we get most of the records from but we do get them from kind of scotland as well uh wales um and that's kind of a, a species that is kind of um uh is known to kind of migrate it lives a kind of a nomadic lifestyle or breed and then those kind of larval will kind of emerge and then fly off to somewhere else um whereas a uh, yellow spotted emerald this was just kind of a, a species um i think it arrived after we had kind of some strong kind of winds coming over from the continent and it must have just kind of <laughs> got blown out and, and and showed up on uh the the east coast um yeah and i believed it quite it caused quite a stir and it was uh, if you were a bird watcher you'd be twitching it it was actually twitched <laughs> um by quite a few people so and i can see why yeah i mean i think uh, i think it was the same year i think we had um, a large white-faced data show up on the east coast as well i think it was found in a moth trap um, I, I apologise to the people who found it. I can't remember the exact details <laughs> of it. Um, so yeah, it's um, uh, we have um, a Facebook group, um, Migrant Dragonflies Facebook group, uh, where people post all their kind of sightings. So if it's it's something that you're interested in, it's um, that's where you should kind of keep an eye out uh, for kind of the late, latest dragonfly twitches. Right, Ellie. So thanks for that. That's a, that's a really really good overview um, of some of the species and also some of the sort of threats that sort of a broader range of species are facing. For anybody that wants to um, find out more about species that might not have come across it yet, I highly recommend this disappearing book. <laughs> I highly recommend this book. Ghost book. <laughs> I, there you go, right. Uh, <laughs> So yeah, so this is the Atlas of Dragonflies in Britain and Ireland. Um, it was done by yourselves um, and it, it's awesome. It, it's, a, it's a really, really good book. And I believe from Fiona that you might be doing some updates to it as well. So, but. Yeah, we're, um, we're hoping to uh, publish kind of a, an online kind of update to um, the 2014 Atlas because uh, kind of, as you heard, kind of there's quite a lot of change going on um, in the kind of the UK dragonfly communities and species are kind of changing every year, it feels like. Um, so we're hoping to kind of get that out. It was um, kind of due this year, but with the lockdown. Yeah. <laughs> who knows <laughs> yeah who knows you know whenever boris lets us play again then we'll be able to take it from there and um, so that's that's one way of staying up to date the other way of staying up to date clearly is by becoming a member and if you do become a member you get now you, you'll have to remind me of frequencies of these but we've got dragonfly news which is oh that's even better at this <laughs> We have Dragonfly News. <laughs> uh, so that's that's one. And we have Data Magazine. Yeah, so Data comes out, um, you get one issue of Data in the spring and then you get an issue of Dragonfly News in the spring and autumn. Um, so Dragonfly News is kind of just kind of general information and then Data is kind of 
more specific to kind of um, kind of recording dragonflies and kind of uh, research projects that are going on. Yeah, and, and both really good. Um, you know, it's, if you're at all interested in dragonflies, they're a really good read. If you're a little bit more than at all interested in dragonflies, now we've got one of my favourite reads every time it falls on my doorstep. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> this is amazing. I really, 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 really love this. Um, Journal of British Dragonfly Society comes with a membership. Uh, this is twice a year, is it? Or yes. This one? Yep. Fantastic publication. Um, the papers are sort of borderline scientific. When I say borderline scientific, if I say scientific, people are going to go, oh, I won't be able to read them because they're scientific. If I say borderline scientific, it means they are scientific, but they're accessible. Um, you know, they, they are far from boring, which some scientific papers, but don't tell people what some scientific papers can be. Um, they're far from boring. And I, I tell you, they are really, really interesting. And, you know, things like finding out about the wimble, uh, the wimble, <laughs> the will um, and, and stuff like that. And, you know, just just a great, great read. I just, I love them. There's even a piece in here about the Southern Migrant Hawker. So there you go. And the Vagrant Emperor. Um, yeah, just to, um, um, just kind of, we've obviously talked quite a, a lot about kind of migrant species. So if people are kind of interested in learning more about migrants, um, check out the Migrant Dragonflies Project, which um, is run uh, by Adrian Parr. Um, on our, um, there's a project page for it on our website and then the Migrant Dragonflies Facebook page um, for kind of all your latest sightings. Excellent, excellent. And can I just check, is the ads available on your website? It is indeed, yes. It is. Now, I'm supposed to be saying goodbye, and I will do in one second, but something else just struck me that um, Fiona mentioned, and that I also saw on Twitter. There's a new Wild Guides Dragonfly Guide out, isn't there, to Europe? It is, um, they, by, uh, yeah, featuring a couple of our um, long-standing kind of volunteers and BDS members um, put it together. It's absolutely fantastic. Um, I got my copy in the post um, so if you are kind of wanting to kind of learn about kind of our resident species and all the kind of potential European species that might one day kind of show up in Britain um, then yeah it's definitely well worth a read and the photos in it are beautiful. As usual I mean you know wild guides are brilliant um, if you haven't come across wild guides yet I did put this on tweet um, you know their birds book yeah all of their guides are really good and they also do the app, which is the Dragonfly app, which is basically the Dragonfly book for Britain mm. as an app. And that's really useful as well if you're yeah. out in the field, because it doesn't rely on you being online. You can actually use it offline, uh, which yeah. is really cool. So um, anyway, look for Wild Guides there. And uh, its full name is Europe's Dragonflies, a field guide to damselflies and dragonflies by Dave Smallshire and Andy Swash. <laughs> it's called what again? Um, I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> Don't ever say it again. <laughs> right. Brilliant. Okay. So, yeah. So, highly recommend the book, even though I haven't got that one yet. Wild Guides, I haven't got that one yet. Um, but, yeah, recommend that to you because the British one is really, really good. And the app, I, I, again, go for the app. There's the iRecord one. Is it iRecord? There's another app with iRecord, isn't it? Yeah. We, um, uh, I record uh, Dragonfly. I record Dragonfly. There. I re there's the iRecord app, um, so all our records um, are entered into iRecord, um, and that's where we hold all our um, records. If you're wanting to look um, at any kind of the latest sightings in your local area, and um, that's where to have a look. Fantastic, fantastic. Right, okay. Well, I hope to talk to you again soon, and hopefully in the field, um, we can go out and do a bit more about dragonflies. I know I'm talking to. Uh, the two ladies that are based in Scotland, whose names have escaped me, which is why I call them the two ladies. Andrew and Danielle. <laughs> yes. uh, I'm talking to them again about dragonfly hotspots in Scotland and also species in Scotland. Uh, I've already talked to Fiona, so that will have gone up. Um, that is about dragonfly hotspots. And yeah, so I will hopefully speak to you again soon. Nice, yeah. Hopefully we'll be able to get out and... Uh meet in the field at some point that that'd be great i cannot wait you know it's i mean it's just coming into hawker season now and i just can't wait to get out and sort of see a few hawkers so yeah. right 
But for now, thanks ever so much for your time, Ellie. Uh, thank you. <laughs> See you. Uh, see you. Bye. Bye. Bye.